Hello everyone. Uh, many thanks for joining this, the fifth and final webinar in the series on innovation and the SDGs. Uh, my name is Gareth James Lloyd and I'm a senior advisor at UNEP-DHI Partnership, a United Nations Environment uh, Collaboration Center in the area of freshwater and environment. I'm going to be your facilitator on this webinar today and uh, Maya Bertule, also of UNEP-DHI, is going to be providing technical support. This webinar series is organized by UNEP DHI and we're doing it in collaboration with the Academy by DHI and of course with other valued partners making the additional contributions uh, along the way with the content. Today those additional partners will be IUCN and Forest Friends as well as DHI. Um, the overall aim of the series is to uh, give an insight to the role that innovative approaches can play in supporting the water-related sustainable development goals or SDGs and so far in the series in the previous four webinars we've covered topics such as monitoring and reporting, uh, capacity building, earth observations and managing floods and droughts and the topic we have today is green infrastructure for development and climate resilience. And uh, on the agenda today, we have Rebecca Welling of IUCN. Uh, Rebecca will be highlighting experiences from one of IUCN's projects in terms of using natural infrastructure for climate change uh, adaptation. Following on from Rebecca, we have uh, Jenna Gami of uh, Forest Trends. And uh, Jenna will be introducing us to some of the results from uh, economic analyses on the benefits of green infrastructure. Rounding off today's presentations, we're going to have my colleague from DHI, uh, Francisco uh, Laurito Torres. And Francisco will introduce us to some uh, urban uh, stormwater green infrastructure modeling uh, techniques. And he's going to be outlining some comparative green versus gray uh, methods, which uh, I'm sure will interest you. We've made some calculations that uh, each presentation is going to take approximately 10 minutes and as usual I'm going to be a little bit strict on timekeeping to make sure that we can cover everything. So presenters, sorry about that in advance but uh, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you'll be good. Um, the plan is to allow for one to two questions immediately after each presentation with time to take some additional questions at the end and to you the participants if you look at your screen in the panel on the right hand side you should be able to see a box for submitting questions if you you might need to expand that box but that's the place where you need to uh, enter your questions or comments uh, as they come up uh, so please feel free to make good use of that and we'll uh, we'll pick up on uh, on uh, as many of those questions as we can as we go along you have to be a little bit careful that you don't close the webinar but if you do of course just just log back on i also need to remember to tell you that this uh, webinar series uh, and uh, all the all this webinar and all the others in the series are being recorded and are made available from uh, our website and also from YouTube and you can find those either um, I think the easiest way is to go to the unidhi.org website um, but before plowing into the presentations I've been asked to um, to help set the scene a little bit about what green infrastructure is and, and why it's interesting. So on to the next slide. Here's a uh, definition of green infrastructure for you. For those of you who maybe aren't that familiar with the green infrastructure approach, it's about deliberately using natural or semi-natural systems or structures for water management. And the aim is to provide the uh, equivalent or similar benefits to conventional built or grey infrastructure. I should probably add here that uh, you know sometimes you hear the terms green infrastructure or I think uh, some of the presenters will be talking about natural infrastructure. It's, uh, it's essentially the same thing. And I think it's probably important for me to stress uh, uh, two important points here. Uh, the first is that green infrastructure in green infrastructure doesn't necessarily replace or exclude grey infrastructure. The two can in fact be 
complementary to each other depending on the situation. And the second is that using green infrastructure is not just about being environmentally friendly, it can, it can actually provide the basis for sustainable uh, and cost-effective solutions as uh, I think we'll, we'll hear shortly. Um, here are a few examples of green infrastructure in action, um, showing how it can span a, ranges of, uh, a range of scales and geographic types. In the top uh, left-hand corner, we have bioswales, which are typically used to divert rainwater from roads. And if you look closely at the picture, you'll note the, the dip in the curbstone to allow water to enter. Uh, we're going to be coming back to this kind of structure a little bit later. Uh, Next on the top right, we have mangroves for coastal protection. And in many situations, the important is, is, is recognizing the role that these type of forests play in terms of coastal protection and, uh, main and uh, maintaining them. Uh, because once they've been removed, protection of coastlines from erosion and uh, inundation uh, can become uh, extremely difficult and uh, have highly uh, significant economic complex uh, impacts both uh, directly and indirectly in terms of damage to farmland and, and fisheries, uh, just to give a couple of examples. Uh, the bottom left two examples are based on river basins. The bottom left is about protecting water sources, both in terms of water quality and quantity, uh, but also in terms of reducing the, the rate of uh, runoff. Um, while the bottom right example is based on recognizing the important role that floodplains play in moderating river flows. And I think that uh, canalization of rivers and or use of floodplains for, for housing development, et cetera, um, and, and the issues that this bring about is probably something that many of you will be familiar with from your own parts of the world. Um, yeah. In many parts of the world, uh, one of the major challenges is the absence of water infrastructure, while in others, of course, the big issue is that the infrastructure they have is uh, aging and needs to be replaced. And of course, um, in many countries of the world, you, you'll uh, certainly find a mix of these issues. But just to put some kind of numbers on, on what we're talking about here and link it to the SDGs, a recent World Bank uh, report estimated that it will cost approximately $112 billion per year, which is about three times the current capital investment level. And this is just for achieving uh, SDG um, 6.1 and 6.2 on universal access to basic water, sanitation, and hygiene. And of course, uh, hiding in that number, there will be, of course, wide variations across different countries and income groups uh, regarding who, who's going to pay for that. But, but that's, of course, a, a story for another day. Uh, the point I'd like to stress here that as part of the SDGs, we can probably assume that there will be a big push towards rehabilitating and developing uh, water-related infrastructure in the coming decade or so. So in addition to, uh, and this will be in a, addition uh, to a business as usual scenario, this push or focus uh, represents an opportunity, of course, to reconsider more traditional approaches to water infrastructure, and that's what we're uh, promoting here today. Finally, I'd just like to flag that green infrastructure typically involves working with nature rather than against it or ignoring its potential, and with an important uh, side effect or benefit being that natural capital is protected and even enhanced. And this in turn provides positive underpinnings for a number of the other uh, related SDGs. So um, I won't go into those right now. We've, uh, we've covered them on the earlier webinars. But uh, so that was a brief introduction to green infrastructure. If you'd like to learn more, please check out the link to the green infrastructure publication available uh, on our website. And I've also included uh, a link at the end of uh, this webinar. So you'll, you'll find it there. Without further ado, I would like to ask Maya to pass control to uh, Rebecca so she can begin. Um, Rebecca, please unmute your mic and whenever you're ready, yeah, we can see your presentation. If you just click inside it, we won't be able to see your icons on the bottom. Perfect. So right. whenever you're ready, great. Okay. Thanks, Rebecca. 
Thanks very much, Gareth. Um, so yeah, I'm here today to talk about uh, the Wise Up to Climate uh, project. So to, just to give you a, a general overview, the, the aim of the project is, is really about trying to increase adaptive capacity through considering natural infrastructure alongside built infrastructure um, in investment strategies for climate change adaptation. It's, a, it's quite a complex project um, uh, with, a, with an interdisciplinary team full of social and natural uh, research scientists. Uh, you can see the logos at the top of the screen just to give you the, the range of partners. Um, it, it's, it's a research project, but it's, it's focusing on two different basins in Western East Africa, the Volta Basin, um, the Transboundary Basin, and the Tana Basin. So we have uh, project partners and leads within, located within those basins to, to sort of ground truth the research. Um, and in terms of, um, as I said, in terms of what the project's trying to do, it's really trying to highlight the role of, of nature, demonstrating that water resource systems need to be conceptualized as portfolios of natural and built infrastructure designed to work in tandem for climate change adaptation. So the idea is that through this interdis interdisciplinary research project, we can uh, produce trade-off analysis, um, uh, providing uh, more transparent assessment for future basin development options um, and, and, and informing um, uh, decision-making processes. So, um, yeah, as I said, it's, it's about trying to, to, um, to put nature and natural infrastructure alongside built infrastructure within the decision making process. For Wise Up there's the assumption that we you know for built infrastructure and its benefits that they're well documented and they're understood whereas natural infrastructure is is less well understood and the benefits are sort of are harder to quantify. So under the project what we're trying to do is is tackle this issue by quantifying and valuing natural infrastructure so that we can put it alongside built infrastructure in decision making. Uh, and we argue that well-functioning natural infrastructure is in fact necessary for built infrastructure to perform its functions better, to realize projected benefits and to secure the returns on investment. So for example, dams benefit from forests that stabilize soils and hold back erosion upstream, and lakes and wetlands regulate flows and store water, thereby reducing volumes of water that must be stored in built reservoirs and hence cutting the cost of, of uh, a built water storage investments. Um, so to deep dive into the structure, it looks a bit of a complicated slide, but bear with me. I think that the key elements here is to understand that the different partners bring a different approach um, uh, to, to collecting data around natural infrastructure and understanding how to value it and quantify it so that it can be included alongside built infrastructure and decision making and investment strategies. Um, so uh, if you look in at, at the top of the diagram, you have work from IMI that's very much looking at trying to uh, build an understanding of, of what uh, natural infrastructure, ecosystem services exist within the basin and then understanding what built infrastructure is there to then get a better understanding of how to quantify this. Um, BC3, the Basque Center for Climate Change, then uses this information to apply um, economic valuation analysis so that this data, uh, this natural infrastructure uh, data can then be valued. Um, and then this information is plugged into a systems model that the University of Manchester builds with interaction from stakeholders in the basin uh, to try and produce a trade-off analysis. Um, now, to give you a little bit more information about that, what happens is that these systems model incorporate this data. So what that means is that it allow, the, the systems model allows um, sorry, is able to consider 10 different performance metrics or decisions or options of the system at one time. For example, maximizing hydropower, providing irrigation, enabling flood recession agriculture by allowing flows to be um, released from the dam, etc. Uh, so it's, it's a multi-objective trade-off analysis. Um, it, it's a complex model. Uh, it, it does demand super, power, super cute computing power, uh, and it it, it uh, does demand a lot of time in terms of building it. So this is very much in a sort of proof of concept phase, I would say, that, that, that the project's in. So it's not per se implementation just yet. Um, and then I think it, important to note is the social science part of this project is that you can have a model that produces trade-off analysis and produces different options and scenarios for a basin. Um, 
but it's also important to understand the political context and the, the drivers of decision making around, you know, how uh, different institutions and decision makers would respond to having that information and how they would use it. So that's really where the political economy analysis provides um, uh, a lens and an insight into understanding how to um, better uh, influence uh, and, and create change and impact through using this data, where, where are the entry points and, and where's the room for maneuver within the political landscape. Um, so just to give you a, a, an idea of project outputs to date, I mean as I said it's, it's, a, it's a largely research based project so we're not per se doing demonstration pilot projects in the field although we are using case studies in the field to test um, and build uh, the research. Um, but there have been various um, reports that have been produced. There's two key reports, they're baseline reports for the two basins, the Tana and the Volta Basin, and they're available online if you would like to um, have the links to that, um, they're available. Um, and then just to give you a, an idea, I've put two graphs on the slide. Um, these are, these are trade-off analysis, they, they, they show the same um, the same type of data, just two different visualizations. Uh, we found that the visualization on the left, the parallel access plots, are much more accessible um, from from stakeholder uh, interaction and, and feedback. Um, but this is basically the kind of data that 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 has been gathered and that, that the model can show. It can show um, uh, different uh, scenarios uh, depending on which options you um, maximize or promote under the trade-off analysis. And then the, the key thing to note is that because this is a, a largely a research project and we're in the research phase, uh, we have a strong action learning component and capacity building component to the project to try and sort of test drive the research, validate it, ground truth it, um, and, and, and really guide it throughout its process. And the action learning has been um, uh, the process that does that uh, to, to, to allow this verification by basin stakeholders. It's, it's an iterative learning process where we have regular meetings with key basin stakeholders um, that, that allow that, that, that provide guidance to the research and trade-off analysis. So this is this is really key for us because it's very interesting. We had feedback from some of the stakeholders in our Tana um, uh, meetings that say actually in in a, in a normal situation they wouldn't have been in a meeting. Uh, sitting next to the the fellow colleagues that they were sitting next to, so it's also providing a platform for potential networking and relationship building, which also helps to um, to to provide a platform for talking about investing in natural infrastructure as well. Um, so again, just to give you tr trying to give you a tangible output here, although it's 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 sometimes challenging with 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 research uh, projects, um, but we are trying to see how we can use the knowledge that we're creating to also um, uh, to, to communicate it more broadly and, and not just um, communicate it through the action learning process with specific base and stakeholders. And there's a variety of project outputs on this slide, but but the main thing is that we're trying to um, target a variety of audiences to make sure that that all of these tools and this approach is is widely available um, and and uh, available for uptake. I mean, I think the the key thing and the key challenge that we've found is that an interdisciplinary research project is is fascinating and interesting and also very challenging because you're 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 talking about disciplines that aren't uh, that that come from different um, conceptual frameworks trying to work together and understand the same process. So um, it, we're also still, we're in the final year of implementation next year, so we're also finding our way. Um, but, um, but that's kind of an, a, a, an idea of, of um, what we might produce and there's a variety of things there from animated videos to policy briefs to journal articles, um, just to give you an idea. Okay, well thank you for that. I've come to the end of my presentation and I've just left a few key um, contact details there on the slide if uh, you'd like to know more. So thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, Rebecca. Please don't run away quite yet because um, uh, I think we've got time for at least one question for you. Uh, I think we take note of the, the link to the WaterWise project that you have there, so I guess we can find those two publications that you referred to on some of the uh, experiences or, or lessons learned results that you've, uh, you have so far that you referred to. This of course is a very exciting project because 
trying to put some value on on green infrastructure is uh, is, is critically important if you want to uh, uh, start discussing costs and benefits and support decision making process on what kind of actions you want to do. So many 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 thanks for that. Um, a quick question uh, that we have: How have basin stakeholders been involved in the data development process? Yes, okay, thanks for that, uh, Gareth. So um, they've been um, involved from the very beginning. I mean, if you look into the work that IMI is driving and that BC3 is driving, um, that, that has actually been carried out directly with local stakeholders. What we've tried to do is take um, a specific area within um, both basins as, as a case study area in the Volta it's the Pualugu area and in the Tana it's the Kamakia sub-basin um, and there we've been working with local communities for example to do ecosystem services mapping so trying to get a better understanding from the stakeholders themselves about what services they rely on at what times of the year these become important to get a better understanding of for example reliance on um, flood recession for agricultural purposes um, uh, so that's one way, and also with the valuation work, this this has been actually carried out at the local level through household surveys. Um, so that's directly trying to um, get a better understanding of of people's uh, of the value um, of ecosystem services to households, and then extrapolating that. And then of course throughout the whole process, we have this action learning process, and we also have capacity building um, events where we are in constant interaction with stakeholders all the way through the process. Um, I should also add that our basin partners as well are, are um, uh, linked into um, key policy developments in water, in climate change, uh, and so they sit alongside um, certain processes and have a, um, a stake at tables in, in discussions. Um, so we, we sort of tackle it at many angles at different levels and different scales. Yeah, yeah, you definitely sounds like you've got that one well covered. Well, thank you very much for that, Rebecca. Please hang around because we're going to be coming back to you uh, in a little while with a few more questions that have been uh, coming through. Um, I'd like to ask you to put your microphone on mute now, and I would like to ask uh, Jenna to uh, to get ready, unmute her mic, and uh, we'll let you know. I'll let you know when I can see your presentation. Right, that's coming up now. Yes, looking good. Great, you're good to go. We can see your mouse if you'd like okay. to move that off the screen. Yeah, okay. we can hear you too. Wonderful. Thanks, well, thank you, Gareth, and thank you uh, also for the opportunity and for to the audience for joining us. Uh, for me, in the morning, I'm I'm coming from Washington, D.C. Uh, so, what I wanted to share with you all today was a bit of work that we have been doing here at Forest Trends uh, with partners, particularly in Latin America in the Andean setting, uh, but also thinking about kind of methodologies and tools that we could advance that could permit us and our partners to advance economic evaluations of green infrastructure to inform specific decisions, uh, even while we're dealing with some significant data gaps um, and a lot of the kind of uh, challenges of working in the cross-disciplinary uh, ways that are necessary to produce these analyses that Rebecca just alluded to. So um, I'll, I'll present a, a, another kind of option or methodological approach uh, to these types of analyses uh, and also look at a specific case study and then kind of offer some of the lessons and tips that we have been, um, that have come out of the work that we have been developing. So before I get into that though, I just want, also wanted to give a brief overview. Probably not all of you are familiar with Forest Trends. We are an NGO that's based in Washington, D.C. We focus on scaling innovative finance for conservation and in, the, in our water initiative we focus on watershed conservation, financing mechanisms. So every two years we put out a state of watershed investments report. Um, we have developed methodologies and tools for economic assessments as well as social impact assessments and we've worked with demonstration projects and kind of policy development processes in a number of places. Um, this year we did a first sort of green infrastructure 
um, a training course with ADERASA, which is the Latin American Association of Water Regulators, with a number of colleagues from water utilities and water regulators. So we've been really trying to get into this sector and try to understand how can we support them in becoming more active and impactful stewards of their watersheds, uh, in addition to the kind of built uh, treatment and delivery systems that they uh, maintain. So first I wanted to take you to a, a specific example to be able to demonstrate kind of what we're talking about. Um, and um, we, for that we're going to Lima, Peru. So I first wanted to show this just to give a sense of what was the challenge that we ended up focusing on. And so uh, Lima relies primarily on three watersheds for its drinking water. It's a city of nine million people, the second largest de desert city in the world after Cairo. And there's a significant dry season deficit year after year. There are also very important water quality challenges. But when we were looking at this uh, and trying to understand how could we best communicate the the potential benefits of green infrastructure, we found that what kind of the, a, a key indicator that would really resonate with the decision makers we were trying to reach would be to look at dry season flows. And so this is just an example of a hydrograph of the Remac uh, River, which is the kind of main water supply for the city of Lima. And here you can see really the importance of the function of hydrological regulation where you the, if we can kind of maintain some of this water in the rainy season, we would be able to fill in some of these deficits. Uh, and of course, uh, Lima has been trying to do this, filling this in by you know drilling tunnels and building desalinization plants in order to bring in water. Uh, but we can also do that by investing in sort of natural reservoirs in the grasslands and the soils and the wetlands that exist uh, in the upper watersheds where it does rain. Um, so here, I just wanted to give you a couple of photos. On the left-hand side, we have a, a photo from a community in the um, high reaches of one of the watersheds that supply Lima. There's a natural spring. Um, so you can see very different kind of conditions, vegetative and hydrological conditions from the lower part of the watershed. This is the Remac River right before it reaches the city. Um, entirely, entirely different story. So we think if you we can invest here, you can really get a lot of impact here. But there are also very different worlds. The high watersheds are really far away. A lot of people in Lima especially decision makers don't know them. And so we found ourselves kind of in this situation where we thought, well, the city could benefit significantly from investing in these watersheds, but how can we communicate that in a way which would address the sort of questions that they would have about uh, really how much of an impact could this have? Would it be cost effective? What's possible to do? And really, how would it work? So we set about trying to do an analysis that would get at that, even with a major challenge of not having, you know, long data sets of monitored data in the region that would assess what is the contribution of these high Andean ecosystems to dry season flows. Uh, we have some hypotheses, some working, uh, you know, ideas of how this would work. Uh, we have some data from similar ecosystems, but there are a lot of question marks and there are a lot of questions about, for example, how the groundwater hydrology works in, in these watersheds. So there is a, a significant kind of question. We didn't find, our, our analysis team didn't really think that any of the models that existed would really adequately answer the questions that were being put on the table with the with what we were trying to do in this in this moment um, but we still recognize that some there was knowledge that was held in our technical teams that could be communicated and there was some data that could be utilized to be able to paint a picture even with significant uncertainties recognized that would be much better for decision makers than nothing at all. And so what we committed to was an interdisciplinary and iterative approach with the idea of, well, look, we're trying to get an order of magnitude estimate to inform decisions now because right now we are losing these ecosystems 
victims for nothing. They're being overgrazed, they're being taken out to fill in planters in the city of Lima. Um, but we could do a lot now relatively cost effectively to, to protect them. So we decided to look at that, to really try to understand that and communicate that in a way that would particularly influence the decision of the water utility of Lima. And this was our analysis team. So we evaluated four green interventions, which were identified through a number of NGOs that are active in the area that worked with up, upland um, communities, that these were interventions that they would be interested in implementing, and they were also interventions that we considered to be uh, relevant to the indicator of interest improving dry season flows. So one of them is actually, you know, there's a question of how if this would be classified as green infrastructure. Um, some people would ask that. We consider it such uh, restoration of pre-infiltration canals, um, and so these are canals that uh, help to infiltrate water that is that then appears in some of the springs that I showed earlier. Uh, improving grazing practices on highland grasslands and restoring wetlands that had been drained principally for grazing. And so this was the main result of our study. So what we found was that green infrastructure can contribute significantly and cost effectively to an integrated portfolio of water management strategies. So in this graph, the y-axis shows how cost effective essentially the, the measure is with the dollars per cubic meter in the dry season being the indicator shown here. So what we want is a really short column, we want a lower column which, which indicates it's more cost effective. You actually can't see it because it's so cost effective but the Amuna restoration, the re restoration of these pre incan infiltration canals was one of the most cost effective uh, interventions that we studied. And then here we have um, the wetland restoration, which is also quite cost effective. But we can also see um, in the width of each column what the potential impact is. So here we tried to estimate how, what's the total you know, potential number of wetlands that could be restored and what's the hydrological benefit in terms of dry season flow that could potentially be contributed from that intervention. And that is reflected in the width. And so you could see here the wetland restoration would be uh, comparatively cost effective but not necessarily contribute as much. Um, the gray indicate a variety of gray strategies that have been uh, implemented or in the design phase for the water utility of Lima. And this big one here on the right is uh, the desal plant which is finishing its construction phase. Um, and so what we found actually, and it very much reflects what Gareth said at the beginning of the webinar, is that if we're not saying with this at all that green infrastructure would replace gray infrastructure, you clearly need both, but having both, even on this one measure of cost effectiveness, can really significantly improve your outcomes because if you don't need to, for example, run the desal plan or maybe you don't even need to build it because you're getting that that dry season flow that you need from the natural reservoirs and the green infrastructure in your watersheds, you can really significantly save costs on your overall portfolio. So now I just wanted to move into going over a few tips of kind of, you know, from this more kind of practically oriented approach, we're really trying to influence decisions as much as possible in the short term while we improve data over time. What are some of the things that we have found that has, has worked quite well? Um, and so first, um, I wanted to suggest really try to understand your audience. So we, we invested pretty significantly in the scoping stage of our study to really understand how could we define the problem in the way that really reflected best the client's point of view. And that this is particularly true in the indicators that we select. Um, and when we think about client, we're thinking from the point of view of how do we finance uh, effective watershed conservation. And so uh, we're looking at who are the water users who would be interested in potentially funding this. And in this case, the biggest water user and the one that was, you know, available and considering investing in watershed conservation was the water utility. So, for example, you know, in some cases, the hydrologists we were working with would be much more... Um, we're much more comfortable to talking about soil humidity, but of course, soil moisture is the, more, the better translation, but of course, that's not what is of interest to the water utility. So then even though it, in, in, it introduced more uncertainty into our analysis, we needed to talk about 
uh, cubic meters of water in the dry season to be able to produce a relevant analysis. Uh, we also think it's important to say what you can, and so we think a lot of, you know, scientists, a lot of experts know a lot more than they're necessarily willing to say, whereas decision makers are working from uh, a lot of assumptions that may not necessarily reflect the latest advances in theory or in evidence. And so we really tried to push our team to work in this interdisciplinary way in order to be able to say something in a, in a useful way to inform decisions and putting the uncertainties on the table, but really kind of um, uh, letting decision makers have the information that they need to inform a good decision, even if it's not the perfect one, and recognizing that we can improve these over time. The good thing about green infrastructure is relatively low capital costs, relatively easy to change land practices, especially when you compare with you know building a big tunnel or a big uh, treatment plant. And so we can adjust over time as we learn more about how to better design these practices, uh, for example, to also meet multi, multiple objectives. And here's just an example. So this is the version of the graph that shows our uncertainty ranges when we are looking at the cost effectiveness measure in particular. And so we can see that, for example, even some of the interventions are, um, are kind of no regret strategies. They're good, you know, even in our most conservative um, assumptions, and then there are others which could potentially contribute significantly to the dry season flow, but potentially not cost effectively at this uh, kind of um, more conservative range of our assumptions. And so these become priority areas of research where we can really invest in our monitoring and understand, uh, improve in the next few years uh, what we think really these ecosystems are contributing and how better management can support uh, Im improved water resources management. And then just to close, I just wanted to mention, we also found the process really helpful. So uh, as also Rebecca had mentioned, the engagement of stakeholders, the ability of being able to kind of educate them about what green infrastructure is, what these hydrological processes are, for some being able to take them to the watershed and see these really magnificent ecosystems for the first time and these communities for the first time um, was really impactful and in just increasing awareness and engaging them in the process. And that can have really you know, broader and longer lasting impacts than the result of the assessment itself. So I will stop there. Thank you again for the opportunity. I look forward to answering some questions. Hi, uh, Jenna. Many, many thanks for that. Um, We've got time for one very quick question, uh, mm -hmm. it, so if you could be brief, much appreciated. I mean, both you and Rebecca fo focused on economic assessments of green infrastructure. An obvious question here is, how common are these kind of assessments? Right, so it's, a, it's actually pretty interesting. So in our global state of watershed investment reports, we survey project developers around the world, and we find actually really surprisingly in our last survey that just under half of all project developers report doing any sort of hydrological assessment, and then only about 12% of project developers worldwide do any sort of economic assessment, and that's self-reporting, so they could have done anything. Um, uh, and. And, but they're really not doing it. So there are a number of barriers that I'm sure we all kind of can can begin to point to of why that's not being done, but we find that this is a really critical area for attention in order be, to be able to scale up investments and in really effective green infrastructure. Okay, it sounds like there's a real job there to uh, sensitize and quantify these, uh, these kind of cost-saving opportunities. So thank you very much for that, Jenna. Uh, without further ado, I would like to ask uh, Maya to pass over to uh, Francisco. We're just waiting for him to, uh, yeah, that's great. We can see your screen. We can't hear you yet. Okay. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you very much. Please. Yeah. Okay. Um, welcome. And I'm going to try to keep it not so nerdy. <laughs> Sorry for that. And, uh, well, I'm going to talk about urban water, uh, urban stormwater green infrastructure modeling. I'm seated in Denmark, but I'm, I'm Costa Rican. So, um, what are the LID practices? Uh, in DHI, we call it LIDs, low impact development. And these practices aim to preserve natural drainage processes. They will uh, typically retain and encourage infiltration. And uh, they can pick up and remove uh, pollutants in the runoff. 
these uh, techniques can be applied at any development stage in the city. So from the conceptualization, an early stage, or as a post-development stage, uh, for example, adding green gardens and retrofitting of streets. What are the benefits or of applying LIDs in, uh, in our cities? Well, they retain water on-site and uh, alleviate er erosion downstream. They reduce number of costly flood events. They restore the aquatic habitat and they improve water quality and groundwater recharge. Of course, they uh, add beauty uh, and economic value to our neighborhoods and uh, they reduce urban heat islands. When it comes to maintenance, well, they, uh, they have to be uh, checked uh, that they're working properly. Also remove the build up debris and unwanted de vegetation because that's going to affect the functioning of these uh, LID units. They require wiring the plants during dry periods and uh, of course they provide city wide maintenance program and engaging volunteers in the city. Now I'm going to scale it to what we are doing when it comes to modeling. Uh, we are basing our approach by means of MyCurban. MyCurban is our product on two, two, two methods. The screening method, which is more a catchment-based approach. And this is a method in which we assess the required capacity or efficiency of uh, installing several LAD technologies in one catchment. And these are integrated uh, with My1D, our numerical engine, and they are, they are um, aimed to be used with runoff model B. Uh, the detail method, well, this is it's a more uh, hydraulics uh, network-based method. And uh, in this one, we deploy the LID solutions in the map. And, and we assess the interaction of this with, with the sewer network. It can also be used to, to assess the water quality analysis by means of our Ecolab uh, engine. What do we do or what are, what are these LID controls that are included in, in MyCurban? Uh, at, the, at the catchment based method you can analyze by retention cells, rain garden, green roofs, infiltration trenches, permeable pavement, rain barrels and vegetative soils. And the, the GUI looks like what you're seeing right now. The approach we're using of, uh, when analyzing these LID controls is that we scale it down to layers, the unit. So we go layer by layer analyzing how the flow goes in these units. Um, what is the infiltration, the percolation, the infiltration to the native soil, and what, are, what is our volume of water stored in the unit. Each one of the units have a, has a different structure, so, so some of them might not apply for the next one. So some cases, uh, what is a bioretention cell? Well, these are basically depressions that contain vegetation, and this is, uh, they grow in the surface. They are also enhanced with uh, engineered soil mixture above of a gravel drainage bed. And this provide storage, infiltration, and evaporation of both direct rainfall and runoff capture from surrounding areas. The rain gardens are actually uh, a variation of what a bioretention cell is. Uh, in this one, is, it only consists of engineered soil with no gravel or bed below it. So there is no storage, only the storage that is uh, captured by the soil. And the green roofs, um, even though they look different, they are another variation of bioretention cells. And um, they, they contain a soil layer laying at top, a special drainage mat material that conveys in, in the excess percolated rainfall off of the roof. And uh, here in Denmark they are really popular, especially in, in, in tourist areas, like summer houses. They look really nice. What do you get when you run this kind of uh, modeling in, in, in our software? Well, you get a, an LID uh, overall performance summary. And this one is a water balance of the total inflow, the infiltration, the operation, surface runoff, under drain flows, and initial and final stored volumes. And I'm going to close the presentation with, uh, with the project, a real, a real project that we have the, um, 
applied here in Denmark is the Mule Vacuum Project. Uh, this is a network-based uh, soccer wave modeling, which means that it's a full uh, hydraulics uh, uh, integration. And four bioretention cells were deployed and are constructed on site. Uh, some stormwater inlets are closed off, uh, connected to existing drainage systems, and they're also connected by outlet pipe outflow control, offset level, and bypass, uh, bypass pipes. This, uh, this is how the structure looks like. This is the model, but you see the GUI. And uh, this is a microurban Ho4 model. Ho4 is, uh, is the utility company of Copenhagen. The catchment delineation was done according to the topography and created on a road catchment to be connected to the cells. The elevations are applied according to the drawings. Uh, the geometries are also applied of the basins. There is, a, there is an infiltration method design for this. Of course, we add the porosity of each one of these suckaways, and uh, we define initial water levels and hydraulic conductivity of the soil. When we say side and bottom, it's because these are new, so we're not considering clogging yet of the unit, but you can, you can actually consider this by modeling with microurban. And that will be it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco. Um, a couple of quick questions uh, for you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, of course. Um, interesting to see those uh, bioretention cells come in different uh, scales as well. Um, in which scenario is it most useful to use this kind of uh, low impact development controls? Could you say a few words about that, please? Yep. Yeah, sure. Well, they're, they're usually used in um, for analyzing uh, common rain events, like uh, and and that's when they are more and more uh, useful. Of course, they can be used for extreme rain events, but if they are combined with a climate change adaptation strategy, as they do right now in in Copenhagen with the cloudburst management plan, in which these are deployed along with uh, with the uh, gray infrastructure, such as enlarging the pipes and adding basins and and so on. Many thanks for that, Fran, uh, Francisco. Uh, Jenna and uh, Rebecca, please could you uh, open your mics again? I have a few more questions for you from the uh, from the audience. Um, first to you, Rebecca. Um, please could you, uh, in as few words as possible, <laughs> tell us what's the timeline of the, the project? and also, more importantly, what are the next steps to facilitate the, this transition from research to kind of real decision-making and action? Sure, thank you. It's a good question. So, um, in terms of the timeline, it was a four-year project. We've got an extension, um, and it will be finishing in December 2017. So, the coming year will be the final year of the project. In terms of trying to take it forward, what we've tried to do through the action learning process and through our basin leads is identify key institutions where we can um, sort of leave behind uh, and build capacity for data collection and also using the systems model. Um, so we're in the process of doing that with the partners and various different basin stakeholders to try and um, encourage ownership of the results and the data and the tools as well. Um, to try and move things forward. We're hoping to potentially also think about a phase two where there, that would be looking more into implementation. Thank you. Uh, Jenna, please could you tell us uh, what are the major barriers con to conducting this kind of uh, economic assessment of green infrastructure from, from your experience? Sure. Well, I think the biggest, well, one of the most important barriers is really good data and methodologies for estimating the hydrological impact of uh, various interventions. And I think in certain ways we have beautiful, you know, uh, options like the one that Francisco just presented to be able to tackle questions around certain types of interventions, especially ones that are more translatable across geographies, but when we get into particular ecosystem source water protection, in particular in areas that are not as data rich as, you know, the United States or Europe, for example, uh, then we encounter a lot of different challenges and, and gaps in what the available models are able to tell us. So how to deal with that data uncertainty and how to ramp up 
data collection to be able to inform those estimates of hydrological value is, I think, one of the barriers. And then I think another barrier is exactly what Rebecca had mentioned earlier, just sort of the ability to form the requisite interdisciplinary team that can actually do an analysis that really is able to adequately inform decision makers um, and then communicate it them in a way, communicate mm. the results to them in a way that is relevant and actionable. Um, and so I think that requires new effort, new types of teams, new ways of thinking about how to translate data across disciplines uh, that requires a, a, another set of efforts. Right, thanks for that. Uh, Francisco, um, question here. What is the approach used towards extreme cold conditions in the, in the model that you presented? Extreme cold? Yeah. So if if uh, I I guess if it's uh, if you're living in an uh, extremely uh, an area that experiences a, a periodic extreme cold, are there any limitations there that can be taken account into the model? Well, yes. Um, by means of adding time series to the operating uh, uh, say a unit, like you can define what is the infiltration along the year. Uh, saying that during extreme extreme cold like like well the, the months of January here you can expect less uh, less infiltration right by by means of the snowpacks in the streets yeah so you can you can add this time series and uh, and then you can model this the effect of this in the function Great. Yeah. yeah thanks for that um, another one for you uh, could you please yep. say a few words about uh, what is ecolab Oh, Ecolab, yeah, interesting. <laughs> Ecolab is our numerical uh, laboratory for biological and chemical processes modeling. And it's a super powerful engine. So it, it is, um, basically it, it is uh, totally cost customizable. So each uh, user can define their own templates, their own processes, their own forces, forcings, uh, sorry, and, and they can uh, run all types of uh, of, of chemical and biological analysis. Okay, excellent. Um, a quick question for uh, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, how are you taking uh, equity into account in the, in the trade-off analysis? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Gareth. Um, we're trying to. It is. It is a tricky question. Um, and in terms of when you collect data and when you look at a trade-off analysis and you look at different options, it is something that that we can't we can't take, we can't not think about, I mean, you, you're talking about different populations and different local populations that will be impacted by um, specific proposed dams. Um, so, so it's very, very important. Um, we've, we've tried to tackle it in two ways. So through the valuation work, that's always, it, it's always a bit challenging because you need to add that distributional factor of one dollar means something different to different people, you know, people's livelihood that's only sustained by flood recession agriculture is different to um, a certain amount of uh, income from hydroelectric power, for example. So um, that we're trying to do, we're doing it in in the valuation work. We're trying to to find a way to um, to work that out. Um, we're also in the model. We're looking at um, also providing non-monetarized units, which means that then you don't have to plot one dollar against one dollar, if you see what I mean. Um, we're also doing it through the benefit functions work, so that basically is looking at what are the functions that ecosystem services provide us, so the functions of natural infrastructure, um, like flood recession farming, for example, and trying to build that into our understanding and our metric that we put into the model so that it's actually built into the trade-off analysis, but also key really key uh, in the equity discussion is the social science side of the project um, through the political economy analysis and through the action learning process to ensure that when we're trying to understand the data um, and the uh, results from the trade-off analysis and the model that, that we take into account different populations, the distribution of benefits and you know who who's going to gain and, and, and how are they going to gain. Thanks for that, many thanks. Uh, I'm afraid that's all we have time for in terms of questions right now. Um, there were a few that went unanswered, but if you have any burning issues, uh, I'll include a, a link on the next slide where you can send those questions uh, or comments. Uh, as mentioned, this is the fifth and final of the webinars uh, that we had planned for in this series. And just for the record, for those of you that are interested, um, 
I think we've had well over 300 participants from more than uh, 60 countries on, on the five in total and uh, with numerous additional views on YouTube by the website. Um, Following on from the success of this series, we've actually already started a new webinar series on addressing floods and droughts. Um, the aim of that series is to give an insight into the role, again, that innovative approaches can play in addressing uh, flood and drought management uh, issues in different scenarios. And in that series, you can expect to hear more about uh, the cutting edge tools and methods and how they're being applied at different scales. Um, that ne the next one of those webinars is currently scheduled to take place on January the uh, the twelfth, and there we're going to be looking at some specific cases from uh, uh, Asia. So please keep an eye open for that one and uh, join us. Further information on the time, date, and details are going to be made uh, available from our website and, of course, very uh, relevant mailing lists, etc. Once once we have the final co confirmations in place. Uh, we're always looking to improve the quality of our work, so we'd be grateful if you could uh, use a couple of minutes just to respond to that feedback survey that's going to pop up when you uh, when you drop out of the webinar. And as mentioned, uh, please send any questions, comments, burning issues to Maya on that uh, web address, and she'll do her uh, best to uh, secure you an answer, or, or certainly any comments you have will be uh, taken into consideration by us. Um, Please allow me to uh, um, please allow me to conclude uh, today's session, of course, by thanking the presenters for taking their time to share their knowledge with us, and of course, I'd also like to thank you, the participants, for taking the time to join in and uh, contribute with your valuable questions. And uh, of course, last but not least, please allow me to wish you all a very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are.